Welcome to Echoes International Podcast, with teaching, interviews and stories of what God is doing straight from the mission field and also within the UK. For more podcasts, stories and opportunities to get involved, check out our website at echoesinternational.org.uk and our other social media channels. Well, it's lovely to see you all there. I haven't got my contact lenses because they're on the plane, but anyway, I've got my glasses on. But uh, just to say as as we start, when it comes to the Anglican Church, so I've been in the Anglican Church really uh, since I came to faith in 1982, uh, the Anglican Church has never really been pro-evangelism in terms of the Church of England. Um, So it's interesting, the best evangelist we ever had was John Wesley, and we threw him out. So, so if we think, I was just, as I've thought about this topic this evening, if we've been thinking about uh, the, the 21st century battles, they've been the same in the Anglican Church. And therefore, I'll tell you what we're left with, and this is uh, uh, unequivocal as we begin, we're left with the fact that the Anglican Church has funded pastor teachers, but it hasn't funded evangelists. It hasn't developed them. I think of my friends who had evangelistic gifts I was at theological college with. Basically, they were told, look, if you want to have a place where your wife and family can live, you're going to have to um, uh, become a pastor teacher. Now, what does that mean? It means that the work of evangelism is something we've really all got to do. So if you've got a pen and paper, let me just give you a phrase um, uh, 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 to begin with. Because uh, as we think about this, I want you to listen this evening as we think about 21st century evangelists I don't want you to listen, do you see as I put at the top here, as a reservoir where you're, 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 you're sitting there, you know, a, a, a bit like this, and I do jot this down to take elsewhere, where you're just saying, well, what, is this, what has this Englishman got for me here? You know, here's what's going, you know, I'm sitting here thinking, well, I've heard that, I've heard that, I've had that. I find the listening is transformed if you listen as a river. <laughs> So actually, you're listening, and I wonder if you can do this, with the two names of people. Do you see at the top of the sheet there, a Christian friend and a non-Christian friend? So I'm giving you something to take back and train others. I want you to be a river to take it on. Could you jot those two down? So as you listen this evening, for the whole evening, you're listening, thinking, okay, John, my, 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 uh, uh, my Christian friend, what would I pass on to him? about this, this evening, How, what does he next need to know, and then my non-Christian friend as well, uh, Paul, what would I do there? And with both of them, this is how you listen, do jot this down so that we can take it away, explore, explain, encourage, listen, 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 where are they? Explain, what's the next thing from the word of God to teach them? Encourage, how from my own life do I make that, make that work? But I'll tell you what, if it's the Anglican church, we ain't producing evangelists, so we've all got to do it. And in your church, if you put your hand up and say, look, I'll run a little session on evangelism, you're the one, because uh, we're just not developing them. So what is the phrase for tonight? The phrase is, if there's a key verse, 2 Timothy 2 verse 2. You then, my son, be strong in the grace of Christ Jesus, so the grace we came to faith with, the grace that sustains us. And the things you've heard me say in the presence of many people, in in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who can teach others. So that sense of the gospel being uh, passed down. Now let me tell you something. I used to have to run as a young curate, evangelism training, and John Stott would be sitting in the front row. And I found he listened differently when I said, who are you going to pass it on to? So if you're young, Glasgow Christian Union or whatever, I think they're there because they look younger. This is the younger section over here. (laughs) Apologies. You all look lovely. But anyway, they look younger. Just to say, when you're there, it doesn't matter who you are. If you know you've got to pass it on, it transforms it. So I was on staff with John Stock for 15 years. He got up at 10 to 5 each morning and slept for half an hour each afternoon. I myself adopted one of those two habits. So, so but I, 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 if I, when I started saying, who would you pass it on to, I could see him listening differently. So, so pass it on, pass it on, pass it on as we begin. Now, if we're thinking about passing it on, this has been three centuries in the Anglican Church, but the 21st century for certain, we cannot, as we begin, think that it is, it is a given that people are going to be giving themselves to evangelism. So you've got to start your evangelism training wherever you are by asking, I think, this opening question. What stops us doing evangelism? Otherwise, people aren't honest about where they are. So I wonder if in pairs you could answer that question for you and your local church, 
for your Christian union, what stops us doing evangelism? If you want to answer it yourself, that's fine. Just turn to the person next to you and say, I don't like people, I'm doing it on my own. That would be fine. <laughs> Off we go. What stops us doing evangelism? Off we go, just in pairs. That would be great. And if people haven't got, has anyone not got one of these? I see one, everyone got one of these? If you haven't, let's make sure we get them. Right, what stops us doing it, brothers, sisters? Over we go. Two names written down. Great, everyone. So, now don't leave the fat Anglican stranded at the front here, everyone. Give me a hand on this. What stops us? Anyone shout out, what is it that stops us doing it? Let's get... Fear. Brilliant. Thank you. Now, let, just to say, that is the key word you're going through. Jot it down, because it's fear. That's your first word. And then, the first thing to say when people say, I'm afraid of doing this, I'm afraid of uh, what the consequences are, and I think fear of rejection. Would that be right? Fear of, fear of rejection. Can I just say, at the start of teaching people evangelism in the 21st century, brothers and sisters, we've got to say, yes, you're going to get rejected. Let me just say that at the start. I can't bear evangelism training that isn't honest with people. We are going to get rejected. So in the culture at the moment, there are two things happening at the same time. There's increased hunger and there's increased hostility. They're both happening. I think there's amazing hun hunger, uh, uh, actually, if you get in behind it. But there's actually increased hostility. And what did Jesus say, Matthew 10, verse 17? He said, I send you out as sheep among wolves. Now, I don't know what a, a wolf can do to a sheep. I've seen what a dog can do. You're going to get torn. So the first thing to say is, if I'm going to speak for Jesus, I'm going to be isolated. It's going to be tough. I'm going to become an outsider. I'm going to be misunderstood. I'm going to be marginalized. And unless that's there, when it first happens, and people aren't warned about it, they then say, right, I'm not doing it anymore. So, uh, and so what have we got to do? Now, if you can write down the word fear, and then the key solution to the word fear is this. Please jot this word down, brothers and sisters. Identity. In the face of fear, I have to find my identity in the grace of God. And here's the phrase. So that whether you reject me or accept me does not make me more valuable. What makes me valuable is Christ died for me. So my identity's got to be that. Because, so, you know, so when I jump off into saying something, when I seek to do that... Thanks, my brother. Um, uh, if I'm... If I'm, you know, if I, if, you know, it, 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 unless I've got that in place, that, so what we're trying to do is, and do jot this down too, is, it, it, is that what we're trying to develop in people is this, in the 21st century. We're trying to develop two things at the same time. A tough skin and a soft heart. That's what we need. A tough skin, because we're going to get rejected, but a soft heart that keeps us thrilled with the gospel and the grace of God and means that we keep reaching out and loving people. Now, I wrote this book, Honest Evangelism. It's actually sold very well. I've sold 11 copies so far this year. It's gone outstandingly well. My wife, by the way, said that Honest and Rico Tice shouldn't be on the same page. But I wrote Honest Evangelism because in our evangelism training in the 21st century, I don't think we're being honest about what the gospel is, and that is that it's offensive, and we need God to open blind eyes as we preach it, and we're not being honest about the fact evangelism is tough. And because we're not doing that, and we stand up and try to persuade people it's going to be fine, when at times it's going to be absolutely wonderful. So Luke 15, it's joy in finding the lost, but at the same time, there's going to be rejection. It's going to be painful. And, and, and increasingly so at, at, at some level. It's quite funny, you know, this book. I, I, um, I was meant to write it on my sabbatical, but it was a Football World Cup about five years ago. You know, the Brazil one. So I watched that and didn't write it. It was pretty hopeless. And then we had to do at half term because there was a deadline with the publishers. So my wife and I sat down for six days to write it. Her parents came to babysit the children, and we, we wrote this for six days. And she's, she's bright and got an English uh, degree. I got a third, and I, I, got a, I got a third at university. When I got my third, I said to my tutor, were well, they close to a two, two? He said, no, he goes a very solid third. So I knew that <laughs> ordination for Church of England was the only career option available. And so there we were, and she was basically writing out my thoughts as we were doing this. And um, after six days of writing, I said, oh, darling, isn't it wonderful? Here we are working for the gospel. And she looked at me after six days, and she said, 
I hate you and I hate this book. So I dedicated it to her to get a copy. But anyway, there we are. So, so, so what, we, what, we've got to, what we've got to do is we've got to get that clear. There's going to be fear, and I've got to have a soft heart and a tough skin. I've got to, I've got to keep reaching for people, whatever their response, and I'll do that if my identity is in the grace of God. What else stops us doing evangelism? Let's start with this. Let's get this in place. This is, what else in the 21st century stops us doing it? Disappointment. Let's get what, disappointment. Yeah, brother, would you just unpack that? I quite hear you. Yeah, brother, great line. Yep. And of course, of course, the problem with disappointment is that we are in a success culture, and in a success culture, you're not allowed to fail. Whilst the parable of the sower tells me there'll be three quarters disappointment. And I love, I mean, you know, it's amazing, isn't it? You get the parable of the sower in Mark chapter 4, when we're told of the fact that the, 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 the seed goes out and it doesn't take root. Two, t- two chapters later, there's John the Baptist. He's running his own little Christianity explored with King Herod, who liked to listen to him, and then he gets his head chopped off, which is disappointing. So, you know, actually, just to add to the disappointment thing, just for your notes, do you remember in the sower as well, there's also delay in an instant culture. So so there's disappointment and delay. Now, here's the issue. We've got a Bible. Can we just turn to this quickly? Let's see how evangelism works. If we don't know how it works, we'll get into such a state, and particularly on the disappointment aspect. So when it comes to evangelism, I've got to know what is my job and what is God's job. Please turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. This little passage, 2 Corinthians 4, 1 to 6, is the most important passage on evangelism in the Bible. I'm convinced just as we turn to it here, 2 Corinthians 4, 1 to 6. Can you have a look down at it, please? Have we all got Bibles? Have we got Bibles, most of us? Hands up if you've got one. Okay, we're a bit... Yeah, okay. Try and reach for it and see if you've got it. But no, actually, we won't. Not enough, so I'll, I'll do it here. here. Here we've got 2 Corinthians 4, 1 to 6. The question to write down is this, please. Who is at work in the work of evangelism? Who is at work in the work of evangelism? And let me read it to you. Therefore, since through God's mercy, turn to it, please, if you've got it, we we have this ministry, we don't lose heart. So it's very easy to be disappointed and lose heart. Now, if you do get disappointed and lose heart, verse 2, what do you do? Rather, we've renounced secret and shameful ways. We don't use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So, in the Church of England, and this is, I'm afraid, the Archbishop of Canterbury, what happens is, if you think people won't listen, the great temptation is to distort the word of God. So you say, and this is what's happening in the Church of England, you no longer have to repent of sexual sin. Don't worry, you can come in, you don't have to change. So the gospel is Jesus is Lord. But because people are discouraged, they're saying, actually, just come and be included in our community. We're not going to ask you to be transformed. So the key word at the moment is repentance. That is the key word we're battling for. Now, let's have a look and see what the gospel is uh, as we look down in the 21st century, as it's always been. And even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age, that's the devil, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. Right, what is... What do I have to do in evangelism? Two things. Please jot them down. The thing that I have to do is 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 5. And here's our job. Verse 5, we preach Christ. And who is the Christ that we preach? 2 Corinthians 4 verse 5. uh, uh, For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord So I call people to repent. I say, he is Lord and God. He made the world. He gave you each breath. You need to submit to his authority and find forgiveness for when you've disobeyed him through his death on the cross. But as we preach Christ, here's the next thing. Verse 6. Can you see verse 6? 
For God who said, let light shine out of darkness. So where's that from? Where does it say, let light shine out of darkness? Where do we get that from? Genesis. Genesis 1. So the God who made the world, this is amazing. How do I get converted? Made his light shine in our hearts. He created the world. He recreated our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. And he gets us to see that Jesus is God. So you are converted when, please write this word down, when God does a miracle and opens your blind eyes with the power that made the world and he causes you to see that Jesus is God. So conversion is a moment of recognition for your notes. It's a moment of identification. And therefore, if you meet someone and you say, how do you become a Christian? They say, oh, it's really boring. I just came from a lovely Christian home and I grew up with it. Do you know what you do? Take them out into the road and headbutt them. (laughs) The reason you're Christian, brothers and sisters, the reason you're sitting here is God did a miracle with the power that made the world and opened your blind eyes. So that's our methodology for evangelism. We preach Christ. God opens blind eyes. Let's just say that together. Let's just chant that. Can this half please say we preach Christ? Could you respond, God opens blind eyes? If you don't want to do it, you'll do it on your own if I see you not speaking, okay? (laughs) Humiliation's a great way of teaching people. Are we ready? So let's say together, we preach Christ, God opens blind eyes. That was very good. That was pathetic. Off we go. And we preach Christ, God opens blind eyes. That's the methodology. Now, how do we preach Christ as we look down? We don't use deception, rather, uh, uh, nor do we distort the word of God. So we do repentance and wrath. We teach the tough stuff. And, 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 and what is my job? What is my job in evangelism? The key is, God opens blind eyes, so the results belong to God. My job is to preach Christ. At the end of a mission, what do people always ask me? What's the one question I always get asked at the end of a mission? What do they always ask me? How many were converted? What's the question you should ask me? 2 Corinthians 4 verse 5. What should you ask me? Rico, did you preach Christ? Listen, if you ask me how many many were converted, I'm an insecure evangelist. I'll say 998 because I'm so insecure. So please ask me if I preached Christ. Now on the disappointment issue, the key is the results belong to God. So my job is to be faithful. The results belong to him. It's a great comment disappointment, but I've got to say, I've got to ask myself, Rico, did you preach Christ? And then the results belong to him. If people were converted, praise God. Now listen, if you don't understand the results belong to God, if lots get converted, what happens to me? I become a big head, pride. If none get converted, what happens? Disappointment. Can I tell you, either way, I'll be a pain in the neck to all of you, not least with my English middle-class accent. Okay, so we have got to get this right. Our job is to preach Christ. The results belong to God. I've got a mate in Canada who got sacked at a church. As far as I could see, he was doing everything right. But they sacked him for lack of results. It is an absolute scourge. I've been fundraising in the States, and they wanted to know how many people had been converted on the course. And they said, give us the metrics, then we'll give you the money. And a reputable Christian organization that had been in before me had said to them, for every $8 that you give us, we'll give you a convert. I then had a fallout with them about actually who does what in evangelism, and it didn't go very well. I couldn't believe that previous organization had said that. Every $8, people get converted because God opens blind eyes. And therefore, and if we don't get it, we start distorting the word of God, which is the Church of England. I mean, you get distorted. So we preach Christ, God opens blind eyes, the results belong to God, and the power is in the word. So that's the next question. Do you trust that this is where the power is? is, I'm going to open the Bible. People come to All Souls and they say, look, the Bible's not enough. And do you know what I say to them? I say, we've got nothing else to offer you. It's all we've got. You need to go to another church if you want something else. But for us, you encounter Jesus as he walks off the pages of Scripture as we open it. And we try and open the Bible at four levels. From the front, we have a talk from the front, in a small group, one-to-one, and at home. 
So let's make sure we get the Bible out at those levels. Great question on disappointment. I hope that's a... 2 Corinthians 4 is the one to do there. The power's in the Word. So if I'm to do evangelism, where there's fear, I've got to have my identity in the grace of God. Where I don't know... Where I think, gosh, this isn't going to work, I've got to remember that the reason I'm converted is God took the power that made the world to open my eyes. So number one, power. That's in the Word of God. Two, fear. The answer is the grace of God. What else have we got in terms of what stops us doing evangelism? We'll move on in a sec, but what else have we got? Difficult questions. Very good. The cults, do jot this down, brothers and sisters, with difficult questions, the cults always have the answers. If you go to the cults, they'll give you an answer to everything. So when you, when you get a very difficult question... What you do is you go, well, I don't know the answer to that. I'll get back to you. <sighs> let's, you know, and let's ask questions. We don't have to have all the difficult questions. We don't have to have the answers. Now, if you're thinking internally, oh, gosh, you know, they're going to ask me something and I won't know the answer, just make this decision. That's only going to happen to me once. So then I'll get the answer and go back to them. But here's the issue in this culture. Brother, sister... You're the one they trust. They don't trust the minister. Not now. In the 21st century, they don't trust me. They trust the person they've got the relationship with. So, when it comes to the difficult questions, here's the issue. It used to be, you bring your friend along at Christmas or whatever, and they hear the gospel, and they drop themselves into a Christian Explorer or an Alpha course. People would just come, because they were low-hanging fruit. They knew they should do something with it. But now... As the gospels, as, as the culture's hardened and changed, we'll look at this a bit more later, here's the issue. You bring your friend along at Christmas, you give them to the preacher for 15 minutes, and at the end of the talk, now if they're to come on and keep going spiritually, you need to take your friend back and say, what did you think of that? So what you've got to understand is now in the culture, in terms of these difficult questions, do jot this down, shepherds don't give birth to sheep. Sheep give birth to sheep. And unless we all do this one-to-one -one work, and whatever the questions are, we say, good question, I don't have an answer, I'll get back to you. Unless we all do it, it's very simple. The pastors will have breakdowns. They'll just have breakdowns. So that is the elephant in the room. We've all got to start doing this one-to-one -one stuff because people need the individual help. The pastors can't do it on their own. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's, just, it's just a huge issue. So, quick, difficult questions. If you don't know the answer, say, I don't know the answer, I'll get back to you. But can I get back to you in a week? Keep the discussion going. One last one on this, then we'll move on. Anything else that stops us doing evangelism? Laziness. Laziness. Very good, very good. Do you know, it's very interesting, brothers and sisters, but I find every year, and I've got three young children, and I'm old because I didn't get through puberty till 42, so I didn't have kids... <laughs> So I'm absolutely knackered. But it's amazing. Every year, I seem to make time to watch all 15 games in the, in, the, in the Five Nations Championship. I watch them all. There you go. So here's the thing on laziness. Brothers and sisters, we always make time for the things that are important to us. We always make time for the things that are important to us. And if we're not making time for evangelism... And this was a huge thing. That This is the most feedback I got in this book, Honest Evangelism. And this is after 25 years at my church. And I love my church family. Brothers and sisters, if we're not making time for evangelism, it's because of idolatry. It's because of idolatry. Our hearts have been won by other things. So when you're lazy about evangelism, I've got to ask you two questions. Question one, do jot these down. What are your daydreams? Question two, what are your nightmares? And that will tell me where your heart is. The Puritans were very big on daydreams and nightmares. And that's why you're not doing evangelism. Because that's what you're focused on. And we'll pick that up a bit later. But we've got to be able to... So that Christian friend who's not here tonight, and should be, but they're doing something else, and their heart's elsewhere, it's idolatry. That's why they're the first two commandments. And I think in the 21st century, this idolatry issue is one of the really big issues that we've unpeeled. When I got ordained in 1995, I had no idea what it was about. And now I've found it's been transformational in terms of understanding. 
Great, everybody. Um, let's, let's keep going. Actually, on that idolatry thing, let's have a film. Let's have a little break. So, so when I'm talking about idolatry, the issue is, um, have a, pick up the bit of paper here, everyone. If you could, got your green bit of paper, we'll do this first, and then we'll come back to other stuff. But do you see glory, the glory of God? We, we, the, the problem is, is, that, is from Romans 1 here, is that, is that we have verse 25. This is why we don't do evangelism. Why are we not doing it in our churches when we know it's true, when we know we should love people? They exchange the truth about God for a lie and worship and serve created things rather than the creator who's ever praised. So what happens is in our hearts, a good thing becomes a God thing. And the reason we don't do evangelism is there are other things we deify. Let me give you an example. Uh, about 10 years ago at All Souls, my church, I was preaching on Sunday, and at the end of the service, a woman ran out of the church. I was standing at the, at, at, at the door. She was the first one to me, and she said to me, tell my daughter, tell my daughter to apply for Oxford University. And I looked at her, this just came straight out, and the daughter then came out after her, and the daughter and I exchanged a look, which was, your mum's a nutter. You know that moment? <laughs> She's a nutter. And the daughter said, I want to go to UCL. What had that mother been praying about and thinking about for the previous hour and a quarter in church? Is it a good thing to want to go to Oxford University? Yes, it is. I got a third there. It was wonderful. <laughs> is it a good thing? Yes, but it had become a God thing. Her identity was in that. And we have to fight these glory wars. For the first 10 years at All Souls, I kept lying to the church family about things I'd done. So they'd say, Rico, have you done something? I'd say, yes, I had. And I hadn't, and I'd run off and try and do it before they found out. <laughs> and I kept lying. Why was I doing that? Because my idol was a good thing, which was to be seen as a fine Christian leader. But fine Christian leaders are efficient. And I wasn't efficient, and I was too ashamed to admit that because I was meant to be a fine Christian leader. What I had to do was find my identity and my security and my fulfillment in the gospel. And once I'd seen that idol, which was a good thing, wanting to be a fine Christian leader, the lying dried up much more. My, it really stopped much more because I could see, no, no, my identity is in the gospel. It's in the righteousness of Christ. And whether you accept or reject me because I've done this or haven't done it isn't the issue. The issue is that God knows all about me. He loves me anyway. So look, I'm sorry I haven't done it. I'll try and do it now. Please forgive me. I said I would and I didn't get to it. Now that took me a minute to tell you. It took me 10 years to work out because we've got to spot our idols. Now this is our Life Explored course. Have a look now at the film. And uh, here's a bloke. So this is week four of the course. We do silent films classic 21st century evangelism. We're trying to convince people of sin, but we're not so much going down law-breaking, although that does, that you always hit law-breaking. That's the overarching uh, issue. But we're trying to get to that in the, west of, in the West End of London and around the world by showing people what happens when a good thing becomes a God thing. So this is for non-Christians. They come in, but it's been amazing leadership training too. Let's have a look at the film, see how it goes. Love, easy, we turn the lights easy. down. Great. Leave an easy feed in every tub and every. This is the start of the evening on the fourth week.
So evangelism in the 21st century, we can have the lights coming back up, that would be great. Brothers and sisters, can you see there? We, we watch that at the start of the evening, just say, come, have a, we're going to watch a bit of a film, what do you make of that? And then there'll be some questions after that, which are questions like, what are your if-onlys? Or what, if you didn't have it, would make your life unlivable? And, uh, and uh, you know, as, you, as, you, as, they, as people watch that, of course it's comedy, but actually... You know, did you see what was on the back of the, uh, on the, back of the, the, the cart? Do you, anyone see what it say? Praise the Lord. You see, now, now as people watch it, we've, I've seen people um, come in London with big jobs and they sit there with their mouths open because they suddenly realize uh, uh, that their lawn is what's breaking their marriage. And, uh, but it, it could actually be, you know, so, so again, good things, good to have a job, good to care about your lawn, but it becomes a God thing. And here's the issue, your identity Become, where, you, where you go for security and fulfillment, where you go for status, becomes that thing. So I don't know whether you're using that in your church, but both for evangelism and for diagnosing why we don't do evangelism, we've got to get idolatry. So Luther said, at the heart of all sin is idolatry. The first two commandments dictate the breaking of the next eight. And so I want to ask, is that, for, for, in terms of reaching uh, uh, this generation, I think it's been it's absolutely crucial. Let's have some more time on that in the Q&A. Right, everyone, let's just go now. Can we just get our, our, our piece of paper here, everyone? Let's just knock out these four Gs, because always, when we're trying to motivate people, we've got to get the four Gs, and I do them from Romans 1, and then we'll have a coffee break. So just do these uh, 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 now. So the first is grace. Now, when it comes to grace... If you're going to be sustained in evangelism in any century, you have to believe two things about the grace of God. Please write them down. Now, this is from Lindsay Brown, who led our IFES for 30 years. And Lindsay, as he's looked at Christian workers around the world, uh, both those in, uh, you know, who are sort of um, uh, uh, paid work or unpaid, he says there are two things that the people that keep going believe about the gospel. Here they are. Number one, it's true. And secondly, it's wonderful. You have to believe those two things about the gospel. And at the heart of the wonder of the truth of the gospel is this verse that transformed Luther. Let's have a look. 
Romans 1, and can we see as we look down, verse 16, 17, and, uh, 16 and 17. Do you see what we've got there in verse 17? For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. So do you remember Martin Luther? He said, I hated God because God demanded a righteousness from me and all I had in my heart was wickedness. He said, I, he said, I long for a God I can love. And then he discovered his Tower experience, 1515. Did you remember what he discovered? He said, I suddenly realized the essence of the gospel is not a righteousness we give to God, but a righteousness he gives to us. So Jesus doesn't just die for my sins. He also gives, not that that's not enough, he gives me his righteous life. So as God looks at me, he sees Christ. So here's a question, jot it down to find out whether someone gets this. Here's the question I ask, how does God feel about you today? How does he feel about you? Can you look at the last week and answer that question? How does God feel about me today? Just look at how you've lived the last week. And the answer is, of course, delighted. God is delighted with you because he's delighted with Jesus and unbelievably we relate to God through Christ's performance, not our own. So here we go. The Christian life, in the Christian life, I don't live for approval but from it. I do not live for approval but from it. How does God feel about me? He's delighted with me. So you, Luther said, how can God be simul justus et peccator? How can we be at the same time justified and sinners? Answer, the gospel. Oh, We've been given this gift of righteousness. As he looks at me, he's delighted because there is a declaration that is made that God says, you are righteous because you're trusting in Christ. I just can't believe the kindness of it. Just amazing. And brother and sister, if that isn't amazing to you, you're in real trouble spiritually because you haven't seen how, how un, unrelentingly sinful you are. So the start of the Christian life is you see your sin you see God's grace, you're overwhelmed with joy, then you go out to do training and evangelism. But Simeon was the great one on this. He used to have long, quiet times. Uncle John was so, uh, uh, he, such a model for him was Simeon. The first thing you do, can you jot this down, is you grow downwards. The art, of, the art of surviving spiritually is I grow down into my sin. I see my own vileness more and more and more as I open the Bible. I then see the wonder of God's grace. I'm overwhelmed with joy. And here's the issue. What I've got to remember is this. The joy of the Lord is my strength. So if I lose my joy, I lose my strength. And I get my joy through the wonder of this imputed righteousness. You remember the story that Luther told? He said, let's put it in modern day language. Imagine Prince William, 2011. He walks out of St. James's Palace. He walks up Haymarket. He turns right along Shaftesbury Avenue and left into Soho. He walks into Soho. There's a woman there. There are needle marks up and down her arms. Her, her language is terrible. There's a stink of alcohol. There are clients who've used her. There's no question she's a prostitute. And imagine Win William that Saturday morning taking her by the hand and saying, let's go. We're going together to Westminster Abbey to be married. And that day... To the chagrin of Kate Middleton, the amazement of the world, William marries her. And then he says, now, my bride, come home and live with me forever. And Luther says, we've been justified and adopted. Brother, sister, is that wonderful to you? And, and you know it's true. Uh, my dad worked in Africa. When I was eight years old, I got sent to an English boarding school. I've just about recovered now. I'm just about through the experience. And... When I got there, I was taught three things. Number one, you're not good enough. Rico, Tice, you are not good enough. Secondly, prove yourself. And thirdly, it's a dangerous world. I knew it was a dangerous world because the boy in my dorm, the prefect in my dorm, got into bed with the prefect in the next door dorm every night. So I knew it was dangerous. And can you imagine when I heard the gospel? You're not good enough. No, I'm not. Christ died for me. Prove yourself. No, I have his righteousness. It's a dangerous world. Yes, it is. But, but he is transforming me into the likeness of Christ. Oh, the gift of righteousness. So, have we got that? Here's the word in our identity, and do we long it for others? Secondly, what's the second thing that's got to drive us? Can we see? Gehenna, the knowledge of hell. Now, I've got four questions about hell. Number one, 
Who speaks about it? Jesus speaks about it. Let's have a look here. Matthew chapter 5. Have a look through there. Just see how Jesus is the, the write this down please, the theologian of hell. He is the one who speaks of hell. Have a look down there. Just look at those verses. How can anyone say there's no hell? 5, 29, 30. If your right hand causes you to stumble, gouge it out, throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for the whole of your body to be thrown into hell. Matthew 7, 13. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the, broad is the road and wide is the gate that leads to destruction. What defines the road to destruction nowadays? Two things, tolerance and permissiveness. So this is what Jesus says. Okay, who speaks about hell? And there's only one Jesus. Secondly, what is hell like? Can anyone tell me from this, what's hell like? What is it like? Anyone give me a, a note from here? What are we told at, at, in, at the end of Matthew 10 to 12? It's a, place, it's a place of weeping, gnashing of teeth. Over the gates of hell are written the words too, too late. But above all, the, the hell is a place of punishment. So number one, who speaks of hell? Jesus. Secondly, how does he describe it as a sphere of punishment? Thirdly, why do people go there? Have a look down. Can you see Matthew 5 there? Why do people go there? If your right eye causes you to sin, throw it away. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. And if you lose one part of your body, then your whole body will be thrown into hell. The people who go there are those who say, I will do what I like with my hands, my eyes, my feet. And God says, no, no, no. I made your hands, eyes, and feet. And what you do with them, you're accountable to me for. So those who go there are those who do what they like, who declare independence. And by the way, this is a good thing, because how I treat you and how you treat me and how we treat the world matters to God. He cares. Uh, at my church in London at the moment, there's a young woman who's been raped in another country. There's nothing we can do. There's no justice. I said to her, we were going around the zoo. I, if, if people have been so traumatized, I find I go to the zoo with my kids with them. And I said to her, there's a day of judgment for the people that did this. So who speaks of hell? Jesus. What is it like? It's a place of punishment. Thirdly, who goes there? Those who declare independence from God. And fourthly, how do we escape it? Well, the heart of the gospel is being saved from hell through the cross for heaven. Now, brothers and sisters, can I ask you, do you believe this? Do you think this is true? This is what Jesus has said. I trust him to say this because he knows as Savior what he has to pay to get us. So one, do you believe it? Secondly, do you love people? Because if you love people, you'll speak to them, you'll warn them. And thirdly, will you weep? Jesus wept over Jerusalem. We're to weep about this. I think sometimes if you come from a Christian home and your loved ones don't go there, you don't quite get it. I remember my brother at my grandmother's funeral bursting into tears as he read the lesson. And I was the only one in the church who knew why. We were the only two converts in our family. My grandmother died saying, I'm a good person, God will accept me because I'm good. So I have little hope for her. So can I ask you to have this mission statement? I think we need this mission statement personally for our lives and perhaps for our churches. Here's the mission statement we've got to have. People without Christ go to hell. Let's just organize our lives around that, organize our churches around it. People without Christ go to hell. I mean, it must be serious or Jesus wouldn't have to have died, and we need to weep for it. And therefore, um, I think what we've got to do is adopt what Jews for, Je Jews for Jesus have as their mission statement as well. They have, let's make Jesus an unavoidable issue. Now, when I then am talking to people about hell, I call this crossing the pain line, or I'm, I'm saying, I say, look, you're, you know, I say, look, you're, you're, this relationship is really important to me. I'm going to say something serious here, but, but um, I, I need to say it because, and, and, and I, I hope you won't reject me because you're really a mate, but I wouldn't be your friend if I didn't say this. Now, back over the page, what does this mean? How did Paul feel about this? Back over the page, can we see as we look down? Just have a look. Do you see what he says as we look down in verse 14? 
I'm a debtor both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That's why I'm so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. So Paul, um, as he speaks of debt, so, yeah, there are two ways to get into debt. The first is that John gives me five quid, ten pounds, and I have to give it back to him. That's the first way to be in debt. But the second way is that John gives me this, and my colleague Craig Dyer over there, he says, he says, he says, he says Rico, could you pass the ten pounds on to Craig? Now, until I pass it on to Craig, I'm in John's debt, and I'm in Craig's debt. And Paul says, that's the debt I have as I push towards Spain with the gospel, as I push west. I'm in their debt, I must tell them. Now, the problem is, do jot this word down. Well, there are two things we don't ask ourselves. Question one is, where will they be in 100 years' time? Where will they be? And therefore, brothers and sisters, let's get this in place. The success or failure of any life, if this is true, is what we do with Jesus, isn't it? I mean, what I do with Jesus is the mark of the success or failure of a life. Because that's where I spend eternity. And the problem is, so often we're functional universalists. We don't really believe this. Or if we do, we care more about what friends, colleagues, and neighbors think of us now than of what Christ will think of them on the day of judgment. Now, what this means is I preach Christ. The mark of success in evangelism is not whether your friends become Christians. That's up to God. The mark of success in evangelism is what? We preach Christ, is that we've told them. The word preach here is herald. Have I told them? Brother, sister, if you've told someone... That's the success. It's up to God what he does. I mean, I long for them to be converted, but that's not my department. But on our street, recently there was a, a, a Scottish lady, actually. We really liked her. And she came to a Mary Berry event in which the gospel was preached. Mary was interviewed. She's a woman with Christian faith. So she came because it was Mary Berry. I don't think she was anywhere church was. And then she heard the gospel. She's not done anything with it, and she's moved away. We're praying for her. But we got into bed that night after she came to the event, and my wife and I were elated that we told her the gospel. We have discharged our responsibility. She heard about Christ and what he'd done. That's the mark of success. Have you preached Christ to people? So everybody, just as we close and have the break now, who do you need to warn? Who do you need to warn? When I was at Oxford, uh, I played rugby with the Blues, and there was a guy in the Blues team um, called Ed. And I gave him a tape of a sermon. I was at Theological College, John 1, verse 29. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And I gave him that tape, and Ed, one evening, for a bit of a laugh put the tape on in a rugby house. And one of the guys in that rugby house was Dave, who was captain of the Blues. And as the tape was being played, Dave got more and more angry, in which I said, look, either we pay for our own sin or Jesus pays for us as the Lamb of God. And at the end of the sermon that they'd listened to in this rugby house on a Friday night, quiet night in before a game, he said, Rico is not my friend. And they said, don't be ridiculous. You play in the front row together, you play golf together, you room together on tour. He said, no. If that's what Rico believes, the fact he said nothing to me in 18 months means he doesn't care for me. And Ed, who I'd given the tape to, rang me up at Theological College, and he said, this was a game changer for me. He said, Rico, I played the tape to Dave. I shouldn't have done, I guess, but he's very upset you haven't spoken to him. I think you need to speak to him. Brother, sister, let's close now, but with a prayer. Who do you need to speak to? You have a debt. You need to say, look, there's no easy way of saying this, but I honestly believe at the end of our lives, God's going to ask us, do you know me and have you had your sin forgiven? I mean, let's talk about this, but I honestly believe it. I, I don't know where you stand on that. We'll talk in the second half about where we go from that. But to whom do you have a debt? And you've known them a long time, and you haven't spoken to them. Now, to speak to them, I've got to have my identity in the grace of God. I've got to have my confidence in the scripture. God opened my blind eyes. He can do it for them. But here's the question, just as we close, perhaps in pairs, pick one name each, maybe the person at the start, and say, Lord God, it's my brother. It's my, it's my colleague at work. It's, it's a cousin. It's a neighbor. But I need to speak to them. Please, Lord, open a door while I speak to them. Let's close with a prayer, and then we'll have our coffee. Off we go. A couple of minutes to pray. Just share the person, 
and pray for that person you need to speak to. That's great. Thank you very much. Okay, everyone, come and get seated. And then Rico's got some questions here and he's going to answer them while we're waiting and everyone getting back together. Got a question from the floor, someone. Anyone got a burning question? So, so that, 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 that's where they are. And um, I, think that, I think that what we have to do, and um, can you see it actually, it's on the bit of paper you've got in front of you here. This is the outline that I, I give people again and again without sharing the gospel issue. I think that, um, do you see the four points of sharing the gospel down here? Celebrate, serve, tell, and exit. So the first thing we make sure we do is, is we share life with them, we celebrate them. Make sure that uh, they know that we enjoy them. I think that's absolutely key to, to being with them. So, so celebrate them. Um, uh, uh, you know, and the way we celebrate people actually is by asking questions, making sure that we're connecting with their life. So often in this self absurd I mean, certainly London, I've no idea, Scotland may be different, but in London people are very self-obsessed, and therefore the Christians, you know, are the ones who are asking questions, trying to, trying to share life. Secondly, serve them, random acts of kindness. They may say they're absolutely fine and in, 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 in enjoying stuff, but, you know, if, if we're just... But if we're just perceptive for where we can serve, that, that is hugely important. I'll come back to this as we go on. But then thirdly, there is the, the, the pain line. You know, they say they're fine, but of course, when they say they're fine, they are blinded by the God of this world. So, so what I am looking to do is, um, in England, if I've got neighbours like that, friends like that, I'm looking to say this, do you want to come along at Christmas? So with all my non-Christian friends, even those who are flourishing, I'm trying to get them to hear the gospel. I don't know, what is this true in Glasgow? In London, it's the easiest ask of the year. You can say, come and sing some carols. And actually in London, we're sing we've got far more carol services now happening than we did 10 years ago. So let's just, let's just keep uh, getting them to hear the gospel. And when they come along to hear the gospel, you know, here's the message. If it's not the best news you ever heard, you can be sure you've misunderstood it. And what is the message of Christmas? What is the key message that a saviour has come and what do we need to be saved from? Our sin. And what's the definition of sin? Uh, this is the key moment for your friend as I'm praying for them if they have no need of God. Sin is how I've related to the God who've made me. That's what's sin. It's not the horizontal stuff. It's the vertical stuff. How have you treated the God who've made you? And what we're praying for is the experience of, of the, the boy in the pigsty. Luke um, uh, chapter 15, the prodigal son, verse 17, um, uh, when he came to his senses. So we're, as we bring them along and they, they hear the gospel once a year at a carol service, we're praying. They'll get to the moment where the prodigal son went, how can I have been so ungrateful? How have I missed the obvious? How have I been so blind? So my confidence is in the gospel. I'm loving and serving them through the year. I'd like to get them to a Christmas carol service. I think most people like doing that. I'm praying for that opportunity to maybe follow up. Now, if they don't want to know, the fourth thing I'm doing there is, do you see as we look down, exit? Now, this is very important on evangelism, this exit thing. Do you see that fourth thing? Um, if anyone won't um, uh, uh, welcome you or listen to your words, leave the home or town and shake the dust off your feet. So if they go quiet and say, look, don't worry, we're, we're fine as we are, you go quiet. But um, if they ask a couple of questions, then, 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 then look to answer them. Does that, so so that's, that's my view. What, you know, in all evangelism, we're training people at all souls celebrate, serve, cross the pain line, ask them once a year, even if they have no interest, see if they'll come to a carol service, but, um, but then exit. If they go quiet and say, look, no, thank you. And, and I've got a neighbor who said, look, please stop asking me two years ago to things. But he's sort of, you know, he's chatting to, there are two of us that are Christians on the street. He's chatting to my mate quite often now, so I just keep praying. don't know if that helps on that one. Second question. How do you change your methods when evangelizing with different age groups without losing the message of the gospel? Brilliant question. Can you please write down three little circles just to answer this question? Three circles which are always the keys to evangelism. From 2 Corinthians 4, how do I change my methods? How do I think about it? There are three absolute essentials when it comes to evangelism. Here they are. First of all, what I've got to have is God's sovereignty. So up here in the first circle, 
God is sovereign. How do you spell sovereign? S-O-V-E-R-E-I-N or I-E-N? E? Is it E? Good, thanks. Just making... Yep, great, there we go. Secondly, gospel integrity. So, number one, we need blind eyes to be opened. God opens blind eyes, so I need a miracle. So the first thing I'm going to do with all these groups is pray. I need to pray that God will open blind eyes. So I don't just need to tell people I need to pray. That's a non-negotiable. Secondly, gospel integrity. With different groups of people, I've still got to tell them the same gospel. I might be leading with different things, like, for example, that film on idolatry to get in there, but I can't negotiate the gospel. I can't negotiate wrath and repentance, which are the two things that define the hardest bits of the gospel in the culture. So jot that down, the two R's, wrath and repentance. So there we are. I've got to keep telling the truth. We don't distort the word of God. But thirdly, creativity. Ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. 2 Corinthians 4 verse. So we don't preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. And ourselves as your servants. So with creativity, what does it mean to keep my right hand rock solid on integrity, telling the truth, not distorting the word of God, but my left hand is reaching for people? And then when it comes to what does it mean to reach people, the verse for that, if you jot this down, is 1 Corinthians 9, verses 19 to 23, where he says, I was all things to all men to win as many as possible. So Paul actually, you know, let go of issues like, um, you know, um, uh, religious custom, that sort of stuff, in order to reach different people. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. So, 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 so what does that mean? That means that if I'm looking to win different people, well, what I've got to do is, what clothing do I wear? You know, so I, I spoke at a church in Australia. At the 8 a.m., we robed. It was an evangelism service. It was a communion, but it was for the oldies. We robed, you know, all done up. The 9.30, jeans and a T-shirt in the gym for the, for the family service. 11.15, Jacket and tie back in the church. So we put on three lots of clothing to relate to the people we are trying to reach. So here's the issue. As I'm reaching for people, I'm saying, okay, what are the, how do I, how do I best connect with these people in terms of language, in terms of venue? So many people in Britain and in Scotland have made a decision they're never going to church. So where will they go to? Because they're not coming to church. How do I reach them? So, you know, they're not, if I invite them along, they might come at Christmas. So what are these three things that I've got to keep combining? Here are the three things. God's sovereignty, here's the word, prayer. And please write down the name of someone who will help you pray. Who's going to help you say your prayers? Anne Neller at All Souls, a wonderful old lady. She was great at, she was great at making sure I said my prayers in the most lovely way because she said hers so diligently. Secondly, integrity, truth. Who's going to help you tell the truth? My wife, honestly, this is the thing about my wife, Lucy. She looks as though butter wouldn't melt in her mouth, but she hates false teaching. Everyone thinks she's so sweet. She's absolutely terrifying. I come back, and I think I've told the gospel faithfully, and I can hear her steaming in the kitchen. I walk in, she says, well, I think you, I think you didn't tell that one straight. I'm saying, what do you mean? But she's just brilliant, because you know, she, 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 can't, she, she was raised in a church that went a bit liberal. She, her brothers aren't Christian. She hates liberal teaching. It's a wonderful uh, person to have alongside in terms of that. And then thirdly, creativity, brothers and sisters, energy. I've got to keep saying, well, that didn't work. Let's try this. You know, so we put so much energy into the Life Explored course, those films, because we're saying, actually, maybe, you know, they're not, they're not going to at first see law-breaking, if only they would, but they're going to see where the idols have put them in a pigsty. Lord, please open their eyes to that. We'll play a film on that, see if that stuff comes out. Does that help? So what we're always combining in our churches is sovereignty, integrity, creativity, and it all comes out of 2 Corinthians 4. Do we do one more question? There's one here. Can you just witness to people by your behavior rather than outwardly preaching to them? Well, of course, there are two sides to that. Number one, brothers and sisters, 
That we live under the Lordship of Christ is absolutely crucial. So my father, when I said I was getting ordained, he said, Rico, I had business colleagues that went from the brothel to mass on business trips. Literally, they went from the brothel to mass. He said, he said I, I just don't know why you're getting involved with these people. They're disgusting people. So we've got to live under the Lordship of Christ. Of course we do. But, but um, uh, the gospel is a word that is spoken. And actually, as we live, here's the, here's the key to the Christian faith. I often say this. The qualification for being Christian is not are you good enough, but are you bad enough? So the reason I'm Christian is I do get things wrong and I do need rescue. So I often will say that to people. So, of course, I need to talk about Jesus because he's the one who rescues me. So what I've got to do is practice being able to speak better about him. And there are three levels of speaking, just for your notes, three levels of speaking. Level one, self-focus, where you're trying to get in a conversation, you're just going to die because you're just, you just don't know what you're going to say next. Level two, um, message-focused, have I got it right? And then the third level is audience focus. When I, when I can forget about myself, I can focus on you and speak. So good to be practicing it. But of course, there are words to be said. Here's the issue, though. I think as the culture hardens, brothers and sisters, we've got to get very good at asking questions. We've got to be able to... The, the question is often how we preach. Not just, you know, what do you make of the Christian faith, but also as we see the knife crime in London, why do you think that's happening? How do you, what do you put down to this knife crime? What's happening? And then just you know, see where the questions take us. Oh, it's the police. Is it just the police? I mean, yeah, we do need the police, but we need dads that police. That's the police we need, these dads. Because these kids that are killing and getting killed, they ain't got dads. So what's happening there? Oh, we've forgotten God's law. Right, so if the only place for sex was in marriage, I think we'd be in better shape. So do you think God's law is a good thing or a bad thing? And do you think we can trust Christ to know what's best for us? But do you see what I mean? I'm asking questions. I think as, as the culture hardens, great to be asking questions. That's what we need to be doing. Let's keep going, everyone. Just as we get our bits of paper here, just the fourth G. Let's just nip the, I just want to get the fourth G here. The fourth G is godliness. Now, this is crucial for our churches. Godliness. You see... At the heart of godliness, brothers and sisters, is being like God. What does it mean to be godly? It means you, to be like God. So here's the issue. You do jot this down. You cannot be godly. You cannot be godly and not be concerned for the lost. God was so concerned for the lost, he sent his son to die. So what does it look like being godly? Exhibit A, Jesus. For God so loved the world, he sent his son. So... He didn't keep it to himself, he sent him. So at the heart of being godly is going out for the lost. Now here's the issue. I've no idea about Glasgow, but let me tell you about London. In our churches, so many people have separated their understanding of godliness from evangelism. So I'm godly, but I never do evangelism. But you can't be godly unless evangelism is at the heart of your life. Because to be godly is to be like Jesus, and he came to find us. Now, why? Do jot this down, brothers and sisters. In the 21st century, how do people excuse being in church, in an evangelical church, and not doing evangelism? This is what they say. Here's the little line they give themselves from the devil. My faith is a personal, private thing. It helps me in my life, but I wouldn't dream of imposing it on anyone else. That's how they justify it. My faith is a personal, private thing. It helps me in my life. I wouldn't dream of imposing it on anyone else. Whilst, can you see what makes God most angry in Romans 1 verse 18? What is it that makes him most angry? The wrath of God, God's settled, controlled, personal hostility to evil, that's wrath, is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. What makes God most angry is the suppression of the truth about himself. The world does it, and when we don't tell others about Jesus, it does make God angry. It is a sin of omission. So I don't know, I often find on godliness, Christians have forgotten 
they've often forgotten that actually at the heart of being like God is doing evangelism. They've sort of separated the two. They think they're holy people. They come to the prayer meeting, but they don't tell others. I mean, you're here Friday night. Thank you. You've come to learn. I don't think you're in the category, but maybe the person you wrote down. We've got to say, no, at the heart of godliness is being like God, which means we go after the lost. Okay, everyone, you've just got a minute now. I want you to look at the four Gs. So grace, Gehenna, glory, godliness. And I want to ask, which one of those four has dropped off your radar? So the knowledge of the truth leads to to godliness, Titus 1, verse 1. Just in pairs, you might want to just turn across and say, actually, of these four, uh, I'd forgotten my identity in the grace of God when I get rejected. Or it might be Gehenna, I just have stopped thinking about hell. And it's reality and the need to warn people. It might be glory. My, the reason I don't do this is my heart's elsewhere. My heart's elsewhere. So we're going to Sky tomorrow, and between two and four, we're doing an evangelism training during the game. I want to die. I can't believe it. I mean, we need, we need to have a typhoon hit skies, but not take the aerials out so I can watch that game. That's because it's, you know, I'm just I'm thinking, you've got to be kidding. Who's put that on then? Anyway, on we go. Um, and then, and then, and then, and then, and then, but maybe godliness, you know, my faith is a personal, private thing, it helps me in my life, I wouldn't dream of, just have a, have a minute, which one of those, which one of the four have you forgotten, do you need to get back up, just turn to the person next to you, say, I reckon of these four, it's that one. Right. Let's keep going, now, just, just to say, um, in terms of this, the, tonight's title, just we're going to have a bit of a, a fresh uh, go now. Just in terms of tonight's title, uh, what, what, is it, what does it look like to be doing evangelism in the 21st century? I just want to do a little diagram here, I hope you can all see it, which sort of picks up our context since the 1950s. So I hope you can see this here. This, I think, is just a bit of a summary of where we are now and where we've come from. So here we are. Here is the 1950s, and Billy Graham was extraordinary coming to London and to Scotland. What an incredible Sco- uh, Scottish mission he had. So here is, here is man, here is sin, and here is God. And Billy Graham comes to London, to Haringey. Again, I mean, the stats, I think, um, was the mission in Edinburgh or Glasgow? Where was the great mission he took in? That's here. Oh, yeah, I'm so sorry to say it was that, that, that peasant place, Edinburgh. It was here. It's in, so, so, I mean, uh, uh, Haringey, um, anyone, any, do you know how many people were converted to Haringey? Two million people went over that, over that um, two months. 40,000 professed faith. 40,000 professions. Here's the interesting thing. Of the 40,000 people who profess faith at Haringey, how many were already in church? 90%. So what happened all over England was, clergy just said, we're all getting in a coach, we're all going to Haringey. Billy Graham stood up and said, repent and believe. And because they had a Christian framework, which was less than the one they were getting in Scotland, but nevertheless was very real, um, uh, uh, people came to faith. So 40,000 converts. I was a student worker in the 1980s, and it was amazing how many kids had come out of Billy Graham, uh, parents getting converted then. Okay, 1995, I arrive at All Souls, 94, and evangelism has changed to this. Here are our friends over here, and there are some great walls in the way of them coming to faith, blocks. And it means that evangelism has got harder because the culture has been getting more worldly. Here are the blocks. Number one, Christians are weird. So if you look at the narrative on the television, time and again, they, the story they tell is a negative one about Christian faith. Christians are weird. And of course, sometimes you do meet a Christian, you go, oh, my dear brother, you are weird. <laughs> Don't you find? You're weird. But here's the issue, and this is important. They were weird before they became Christian. Some people are just weird. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, in London, it's amazing. We're right next to the BBC. And they're, you know, they're lovely neighbours. They allow us to use Sunday school in the, in the BBC. They're lovely to us. But let me tell you, if we've got a weird member of the church family, they'll have him on telly. They'll find him or her. It's incredible. 
And I've got, we've got some really godly people. They don't want them because there's a story they're telling. There's a narrative they're telling about Christian faith. So number one, Christians are weird. Secondly, the Christian faith is irrelevant. That's the next thing. It's irrelevant. So, so you know, you know um, uh, 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 it's, the real life is on the ground floor, and this is one of the things you can believe. But the thing about it is, it's a hobby. So it's just a personal choice. And therefore, you know, if it, if it makes you happy, that's fine, you can pursue it. But it's no more than that, and it's no more important than croquet. Look, if you love croquet, fine. But I'm just saying, you know, that's where it is. It's irrelevant. I've got a friend who was going around, an American friend, going around uh, uh, Salisbury Cathedral. And he decided to give the guide a bit of a hand. He said, what's happening with the Christian faith now in this country? And the guide said, oh, it's irrelevant now. Quite irrelevant. Doesn't, no, no, no. But this is a lovely building. Look, let me tell you something. Round the world, round the world, the world views us in terms of Christianity as we view Saudi Arabia in terms of Islam. They see us as the home because all the places in the world that have got churches, they look around and say, where did people come from? And they came from England and Scotland. That's where they came from, and Wales. Why is South Korea pouring so much into Wales? Because they say, we owe them our faith. So what happens here is crucial because the world says that's the barometer of Christianity. Just as we look at Saudi Arabia, it hasn't got the most Christians at all. So we've got to understand that, and that's why if there's immorality in the church, the Bishop of, the bishop of Lahore said to me, I said, what, do you need us to do something, thinking it would be a financial thing? He said, no, be faithful to the gospel, because I'm being stopped planting churches in Lahore, because they're saying, we've looked at the YouTube, we know you're not faithful, because they look at what happens in Britain and with the liberals. We've got to be faithful. Anyway, irrelevant. Uh, secondly, let me, let me stop on that one. Thirdly, uh, untrue. It's just not true. That's the next thing people believe about. It. That's the next thing that's there. And, and actually, you know, so, so many people... You know, I was, I was once preaching at Oxford Circus. So I have a sketchboard, go down to Oxford Circus, preach there, invite people along. Once I was preaching, it was amazing. I got a massive crowd. I thought, this is incredible, this crowd. I looked behind me, a drunk had lit my sketchboard. It was in flames behind me. <laughs> but a German girl once was standing there, and she was laughing at me. I said, What's, I said why are you laughing? Just a little two-minute talk. She said, because there's nothing there. So 40% of people in the UK think Jesus is a mythological figure. 40% of people. They don't even think the historicity is there. I was at a school mission earlier this week. They, 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 honestly, the kids there, they just don't think it's true. They think it's Mickey Mouse. Incredible the state we're in. And then homophobic. That's the next block. Christians are homophobic. Now, just to say we're not, uh, here's a survey that's incredibly important. Do jot this down. Talking Jesus. I mean, it, I use this in England. I'm afraid it's not Scotland too. It'd be fascinating to know what the survey was. Done by Barna, by the Evangelical Alliance, the Church of England and Hope UK, www.talkingjesus.org. This is incredible. What percentage of people in England have got a Christian friend they like? What percentage of people do you think in England have got a Christian friend whom they like? I, I, I couldn't believe this. 67%. Two-thirds of people in England have a Christian friend they like. Of that 67% who've got a Christian friend they like, what percentage of them would like to know more about Jesus? Of that 67% of the population. Answer, 20%, which is 7.5 million people. There are 7.5... You talk about what's happening in Britain today. There are 7.5 million people who like their Christian friend, and if asked, want to know more. That means you're going to get an 80% rejection rate, by the way, from people that like you. They say, I like them, but I don't want to know any more about it. But here's the next bit. In Talking Jesus, of that 67% who've got a Christian friend they like, what percentage of them think that Christian friend they like is homophobic? Anyone got an idea? How many think, okay, I've got this Christian mate, I really like him, but he's homophobic. How many, anyone got an idea? Who thinks the percentage is more than 20%? Who thinks the percentage is more than 40% think that friend is homophobic? Who thinks it's more than 
60%. Okay, now this is really important, brothers and sisters. 6%. 6% of people in the UK who've got a Christian friend they like, there's not the sort of picture of the church, but their friend, they know we're not homophobic. They know we've repented of that. Doesn't mean we're not orthodox, but don't allow people like Stonewall to beat you with that stick because the real person on the street goes, my friend's not like that. There are four gay couples on my street. We hold the keys for two of them. We're great friends. They, we might disagree with their lifestyle. We're friends. We celebrate them. So don't allow that to, to keep knocking that. And when we do see homophobia, um, um, and you know, if there are gay jokes, we can't, we've just got to renounce it. But here's the issue. Just for your notes, please jot this down. The key, the key is livingout.org. Livingout.org, who are the same sex-attracted Christians, people like Vaughan Roberts, Sam Albury, Ed Shaw, who are celibate, single Christians, saying, I am same-sex attracted. Please allow me to be safe and allow me to follow Jesus, and I know that he doesn't want me to fulfill those urges. So that, there is the narrative. You know, it's, and they, they say, you know, I need the church to be a safe place. Wonderful, guys. Livingout.org. I use it all the time. But nevertheless, the narrative and the culture is those things. So here's man, uh, and here's our sin, and here's God, and it takes longer. So in 1995, often it would take 18 months or maybe two years to get people on a Christianity Explored course. And you'd have to build two things for your notes, trust and belonging. So that's where we were. But still, a lot of people would drop into courses because of the Christian heritage we've got. But where are we today, 2019? In 2019, people are on a, different, a totally different road in the culture. They're not, they're not believing what we believe. They're not heading towards faith. And therefore, in terms of people coming to faith, what is the absolute key now? This is the silver bullet for evangelism in the West End of London for the next 30 years, I'm convinced. I don't know what it will be in Glasgow, but this is the silver bullet. If you want to know about evangelism in the 21st century, here's the one thing I would say to you. The key to evangelism as we go forward is one-to-one -one work. It's, it's the link between an individual. It's this individual following up his friend, her friend. That's how people are getting converted. So what's the key passage? The key passage for the next 25 years, I think, in our churches is this. Luke 15, verses 1 to 9. The lost coin, the lost sheep. Evangelism will be about going after lost sheep. And here's the word, tracking people. The people I'm seeing come to faith, God is opening their blind eyes, but the old system of, oh, we just run a Christian Explored course, we have the right structure in place in terms of Christmas and Easter, people bring themselves along, that's not working. Now, if people are coming to faith, here they are, as I said before, they come to a carol service, they don't drop themselves in. At the end of the service, you have to say, do you want to have a look, a little look at the Bible with me? You look at it one-to-one, -one, and then they come on a course. Now, let me give you an example of this in terms of just classic. There was a girl called Anna who worked at Covent Garden. She was a French uh, ballet teacher. And she came to Christian Explored, then she came again. Then she uh, went through sort of Life Explored, then Discipleship Explored. Then she was converted and she became a springboard leader, our, our, our course. Then she came back and led on Christian Explored. She met Graham on Christian Explored. They both led together and they got engaged and got married. And they've had a little girl called Annalise. And I was very upset they didn't call Annalise Christian Explored. I thought they would do. <laughs> anyway, it was Annalise's baptism. And I'm sitting there thinking, here is the model product of the structures that I've set up at All Souls. I'm almost fainting with self-righteousness as I interview her, thinking, here we are. You know, Anna's come all those, through all those different courses, and here she is. Um, it's the baptism of her baby, Rico Tice. Well done. She stands up, 
And in, as I interview her, I said, Annie, Anna, just tell us about this. And she, she points across. She said, Jenny is going to be a godmother. And she has just held my hand for five or six years since we met on a bus. And she's put me on each of the courses. Although she lives in the West Midlands and I live in London, she just kept in touch by phone and saw me. And she got me to do these different courses. And she's guided me all the way through. And she's a godmother. So today I just want to say, Jenny, humanly speaking, it's all down to you. And I almost wanted to shoot myself. <laughs> it was an individual. And it's really hard work. And particularly in this individualistic culture, but the people I'm seeing to come to faith, and I am seeing people come to faith, have somebody in behind tracking them. Now, here's the problem. If you come from a Christian home, this happened automatically and subconsciously. Because your parents just said, oh, darling, here's Sunday school. Here's a group you should go on. We'll, we'll read the Bible together. People didn't even realize it was happening. But what we've got to do now is be far more, here's the word, do jot it down, intentional about this, about linking up with an individual and staying with them. So as I said at the start of the evening, gospel work is from the front. The Bible's taught at the front. It's taught in a small group. Please jot these down. It's then thirdly, one-to-one, -one, which is what I'm talking about, opening the Bible. And lastly, you look at it at home. Now, what I want you to do now is score the first church you ever went to out of 10 from the front for its preaching. What was the preaching like from the front? Score it out of 10 for the small group work. In other words, if there was no small group work, they get naught. But let's give, me, give us a score out of 10 for how good the small groups were in terms of loving you and teaching you the Bible. Did anyone open the Bible with you individually, one-to-one? -one? Did anyone say, hey, let's look at John's Gospel together and just coach you along? And then, how much, as far as you could tell, personal Bible reading was there? Give that a score out of 10. So in the church family, how much were people looking at the Bible for themselves each day? Okay, over to you. Just can you jot your scores down, please? Jot your scores down from the front for preaching from the front. Small group for the first church you ever went to. One-to-one. -one. One girl gave me 10 out of 10 for the preacher. I said, who was the preacher? She said, my dad. I thought it was very sweet. Off we go. Give me the three scores, everyone. Front, small group, one-to-one -one at home. Off you go. Four scores out of ten for the quality of Bible. First church you went to, from the front, small group, one-to-one -one and at home. Four scores. If this is the first one you're in. No, no, no. If you went to another church before you became a Christian. Yeah, where you... So maybe you went along to a church that was hopeless when you were seven. That's the first church. And probably its scores won't be very good. So just, yeah. Not, the, not a church you've been converted in. The first church you went to. First church you went to. Not the church now. Maybe it's the same church. Four scores. From the front, what was the preaching like in terms of faithfulness and relevance? Small group, what was that like? Did anyone do one-to-one -one with you? What about reading it at home for yourself and, and in that in the church family? Great. Let's have a... Ma'am, can you give us your four scores? Where was the first church you went to? Never sit near the front. Anyway, what have you got? Give us... What's... Okay, the five for preaching from the front. Was there a small group? Yeah, Bible class once a week. Did you have that? Yeah, And quite, quite good. Was it all right? What did you give it out of 10? A five. Did anyone look at the Bible with you one to one? Nought. But out of, no, but not, not in the church. Nought. What about reading it at home in the family? Eight. Five, five, nought, eight. Um, brother, give us, your, give us your four. From the front? Preaching from the front, what was the quality of it like? Five? What was the... Was there any small group work? Were you in a small group? Nought. Did anyone read the Bible with you one-to-one? -one? What about reading it for themselves at home? How much? Nine. 
Fascinating. Five, naught, naught, nine. Okay, could you please stand up if your lowest number is one to one? If your lowest number is one to one, or it's your equal lowest, please stand up. John, come up here. What percentage of the room is that? What do you reckon? I reckon that's 90%. Yeah, yeah. In fact, sit down. Stand up if it's not one-to-one. -one. If you're sitting now, just stand up. <laughs> Everybody. Now look. Okay, do sit down, all of you. Thank you. Everyone, that's the talk tonight. That's the talk. It's exactly the same all over the UK. That's the talk. If you want to know what we've got to do on evangelism, we've got to start doing this one-to-one -one stuff. It's not just the pastor's job. It's all of our jobs. So my job at All Souls is to equip the church family to be doing it. I'm doing it, but it's getting the church family to be doing it. When it wasn't part of how they grew up. I'll tell you one place where it was amazing. I did this in, Mar in Melbourne, Australia. And I said, please stand up if your lowest number's one-to-one. -one. And, and it was the... It was two archbishops and the, the, the archdeacons and the bishops and the clergy. And it was amazing. I looked around the room and they all said, oh no, someone read with me. And I thought, yeah, that's why you're all church leaders. You were the ones who were picked out and read with. It was extraordinary. It's just not happening. And in the culture today, they're not just going to bring themselves. That is the issue. So can you just please turn to these handouts I've given you, which is the word one-to-one. -one. Here's a little example of what it means to look at the Bible with someone one-to-one. -one. Could you just read through it in pairs? Now, the great thing about this is, read through the, the right-hand page, which is, which is this is a, a Bible study that we're using in London. The right-hand side is just, as you can see, Mark's, uh, John's Gospel. The left-hand side is a commentary on it. You, don't get, you get the answers as well as, uh, as well as the questions. Have a look at it. Just take it out for a drive. Spend a couple of minutes just looking at that because this is the way forward. We've got to be able to say to people, do you want to have a look at the Bible with me, particularly after a carol service? And here we are. There's no embarrassment because you've got the questions and the answers. Just have a look at it because this is what we're trying to train with, I think, all over the country. Just in pairs, this is evangelism going forward in the 21st century. By the way, everyone, as you look at it, I'm a course guy. I've just spent 25 years getting courses. Christian Explored, Life Explored. Why am I saying this? Because I can't get them on the courses where they learn church unless we, we're doing this individual stuff. Amen. That's the issue. I can't get them on there. So this is the silver bullet. Over to you. Just take it out for a drive. Just see how it goes, just in pairs. Read it through and just see what it's like, just having a look at the questions and the answers so here's the start of it. John 1. Do you want to look at the Bible with me? Open it up. Read through. Over to you. Just have a little look. Everyone got it? Great. Off we go. Five minutes. Have a little look. Okay, everyone. What, we're, I'm, what I'm saying is, I think this is what we've got to be doing. Now, I just want to tell you how I got converted. Can you see on, on your green sheets... There's Psalm, on the back of the green sheets, there's Psalm 103. Psalm 103. Okay, there it is on the back there. And the key to looking at the Bible with someone is asking the right questions. It was 1982. My godfather had just been killed in a cliff fall. I was from a tobacco family. I was from a non-Christian home. I was playing tennis with a 19-year-old. Between sets of tennis, this 19-year-old crossed the pain line. He said, do you want to have a look at the Bible with me? Well, I was touched he was playing tennis. I, I, my godfather had been killed. I said, okay. So he opened up Psalm 103, these verses here, and he asked me two, he read it through, and then he asked me two questions from Psalm 103. Who's an Anglican here? Any Anglicans? Put your hand off your Anglican. Very wise. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is what's read at the Anglican funeral. As man his days are like grass, he flourishes like a flower of the field. Anyway, he, he read this to me, and then he said to me, as we were sitting by the tennis court, he said to me, Rico, what does this passage say about man? And what does it say about God? Have a look down. What does it say about man? Do you see as we look down? He knows, that we're, he knows how we're formed. He remembers we're dust. He said, you're going to be able to hoover us up one day. That's the brevity of life. 
The next verse, he says, as man is days of right grass, he flourishes like a flower of the field. He said, actually, he said, but the reason people don't bother with God is they're flourishing. So what does human rebellion look like in Glasgow? It looks like people flourishing. And because they're flourishing, they say, I don't need God. And the Bible says, yeah, you do flourish, but it's over so quickly. It's placed and remembers it no more. Maybe you're in central London, and maybe you're a great one, and I'm sure it's in Glasgow too, and you get a statue. Well, let me tell you, what are statues in, London, in Glasgow used for? Now they're toilets for pigeons. That's what they are. But one day the statue will go. They won't remember you. So he says, you can flourish, but you die. It'll all be over so quickly. We're like grass. We're on a moldy old glass tennis court. He picked up a bit of grass, threw it in the air. He said, we just blow away. But then what does it say about, about God? Do we have a look down? As a father has compassion on his children, verse 13, the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. He said, this fear here, Rico, I just remember it so vividly. He said, it's like my fear of the sea. I love the sea, but I don't play games with the sea. I respect the sea. I don't go 30 miles out. And the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. And then here was my conversion verse, verse 17. Have a look down. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children. Oh, do you know, I can remember it like it was yesterday. He said, Rico, God lives forever. And if you link up with God, you'll live forever. So the key thing to do in life is link up with God. Now, at that moment, he lifted me up and I saw over the fence into eternity. And I've spent the next 35 years working out that moment. My eyes were opened. I thought, of course, you live for God. Of course you do. Now, what was that? Brothers and sisters, that was a 19-year-old with five verses over five minutes and two questions. Just opened it up individually. But I tell you what, it changed my life. I suddenly thought, yeah, you live for God. That's what you do because we're here for such a short time. Now, that's one-to-one -one work. Get the Bible open, look at it, say, do you want to have a look? Now, if you say, do you want to have a look at the Bible with me, what can they say back? There's one or two things they can say. What can they say? Yes or no. That's what they can do. Now, let me tell you, so the first time I read the Bible with someone, so he'd done that with me when I was 15. I was at Bristol University. I'd had, my parents then wouldn't let me go to a Christian camp to get trained because they didn't like Christianity, so I wasn't allowed to go away and, and go to camp. Um, and I, I started at Bristol University, and um, I was lining up in a rugby drill. And then, um, uh, sorry, this was in my second year. It was pre-season. And there we were, and um, there was a guy called Andy in the rugby drill. And... Uh, and uh, I said, oh, mate, how was, how was the holiday? And he said, terrible. I said, what happened? He said, my brother got killed in a farming accident. I said, what? He said, yeah. He said, this, this machine collapsed on him. We just went to hospital and collected his clothes. He just was killed. I said, Andy, oh, mate, I'm so sorry. He said, yeah. He said, and then he said this to me. He said, my brother was a Christian. I said, your brother was a Christian? He said, yeah. So then, I, I mean, I didn't know what to say, but I said, well, do you want to look at the Bible with me? And he went, Yeah. Well, I didn't know what I was going to do. I was from a tobacco family. <laughs> but someone had told me that Isaiah 53 is good. Did you know that? Yes. Apparently, it's good. So I got my questions. I thought, what you do is look at it. So I got my four questions, and I went round to his flat in Redland in Bristol. I opened up Isaiah 53, and he'd shuffled around and got a Bible from somewhere. Anyway, I read it to him, and I was so nervous. As I read it to him, I started sweating. And he said, are you all right? I said, yeah, I'm fine. He said, you're sweating on the Bible. I said, no, no, I'm fine. I said, I've got some questions, Andy. And I asked him my questions. He's a classic rugger head. He went, yeah, no, no, yeah. We were done in three minutes. It was over. <laughs> then I said a little prayer. I said, do you want to meet again? He said, yeah. He said, are you going to sweat so much next time? I said, I hope not. <laughs> you just got to start. Brothers and sisters, you've just got to start. And no one started with you, but you've got to start with other people. And that's the key to the flourishing of Christian faith, humanly speaking, in Glasgow. That's the key. That's the key to London. We can run all these events, and there's a question here which says, how important is literature, literature evangelism, tracks books? Really important, but someone's got to be tracking them, be on their shoulder explaining it. Saying, look, here's, here's some, come with me to some training on evangelism. Here's a group you can go to. Are you reading the Bible? And we need a whole new level of it because the problem is, in our churches, people think this about this. They think, it's not my job, it's the pastor's job. That's the problem. It's not my job, it's the pastor's job. 
Brothers and sisters, the pastors are going to have breakdowns because the trouble is we've all got to go after lost sheep. That's the issue we're facing. So let's close now, and I just want you to just close by looking, can you see the benefits and the building blocks of it? Just the last thing here, just in pairs, you've got a couple of minutes. What are the benefits of one-to-one? Understanding, application, example, confidentiality, training, flexibility. Give me, what does that mean, everyone? Just have a look through. What do you think I mean by those five benefits? You've just got a minute. Turn to the person next to you and say, that's what it means. And then we're finishing in, um, uh, in six minutes' time. What are, we, what are the benefits there? So what does each one mean in terms of one-to-one? Understanding, application, example, confidentiality, training, flexibility. Over to you, what do they mean? What do we mean by understanding? What do we mean by understanding here? What's the benefit of one-to-one in terms of understanding? Mate, yep. You can specifically see if they've got it. You can keep asking questions to see if they've got it. Look, I took the funeral of a guy or souls, and his son had been in the congregation in one of our, in our music ministry for 20 years. 20 years. When I went to take the funeral and sat down to prepare it, it was obvious to me that the son, who'd been in 20 years, all souls, was unconverted. And he'd been part of it, but no one had ever sat down and said, what do you think about that? Where are you on that? He was grieving, but he wasn't Christian. It was amazing. Understanding allows me to go, have they got it? What other voices are they listening to as we look at a passage? You can find out where they are. What about the next one? What about uh, application? Why is application so great? Put it into action. Put it into action, but also it's specific to the person you're meeting with. What does it mean for them? There's a guy I'm meeting with at the moment who, who... who um, is involved in the sort of you know, music industry, I can apply it to him when he's having to be on tour or whatever it is, you know, as, he, as he serves a, a larger gr- group. But I, what does it mean for you? Application to the person. What about the next one, Dan? What's great about example? What about example? They can see your life. In London, we're great at inviting people to church, but not to our lives. We can't just invite them to church. We've got to invite them into our lives. We loved you so much that we shared with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. It's, they can see you living it as they come round. And, you know, I had one guy who came round. I used to try and tidy up the flat, and I'd chat with him as I was tidying up the kitchen. And he said to me, he was from a Hindu background, he said, Rika, it's very interesting watching you. You tidy up the kitchen very badly, but at least you try to tidy it up. <laughs> he said, I never try and tidy it up. I mean, you know, but you just share life. Victories, defeats, failures. My dad had terrible dementia, violent dementia. He was there as I was talking about trying to cope with it, trying to work out how how does this help me be godly as I'm... Dad keeps getting chucked out of old people's homes once with a police escort. I mean, you know, Dad! You know, okay, but it was making me more like Christ. I could feel it. What about, as we look down, what about confidentiality? What's great about one-to-one on confidentiality? It's a safe place. It's safe. It's not going anywhere. So you can really get to know and chat. Training. What's their next step? Please write that down. What is their next step? In two areas, serving and learning. Serving and learning. How can they serve the homeless? What can they do? How do we help them do that? Learning. What's the next thing? Christian Explored course, Life Explored, whatever it is. Alpha, whatever they're doing next. But, you know... How are they going to learn? Coming on a Sunday, reading them one-to-one, re- uh, maybe reading with someone else. What about flexibility? What's glorious on flexibility? It's just the two of you meeting. You don't, have to, you don't need a group. You can just meet together. Get the Bible open. Okay, last ones. What about character, conviction, competence, courage? What do they mean? Over to you. One more minute. You've got a minute. What are, what are those four things? Character, conviction, competence, courage. Then we're closing. What do you mean by character? Okay. Character. Brothers and sisters, let's finish. One minute. Character. Are you someone who's repenting and believing of sin? The people who do this work aren't stuck in sin. What they're doing is they keep saying, I'm sorry for my sin, Lord. I'm repenting again. And, and I find if someone's, you know, if someone's just knee-deep in pornography, they don't do this because, because they're, not, they're not able to repent and believe. But what we do is we, we keep fighting our sin, and those people are released to do this. 
So character, I find the ones who make themselves available are actually saying, look, you know, I'm, I've got all these battles, but I keep saying, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry, I keep battling to repent. Convictions, oh, brothers and sisters, please hear. Convictions, this is my job. This is my job. This is my fight. It's not just the pastor's fight. That's the key tonight as you leave here. This is my fight. I'm going to start. And the second conviction is the word of God will do its work. The Bible's where the power is. I just have to get the Bible open. It'll do its work. Some people here are going, I tell you what, you're here, but you're going, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. I'm not going to get it open with the neighbor or whatever. You're, you know, but others will go, no, I know, I know I've got to do it. All the pastor's going to have a breakdown. This is the key to the survival of the gospel and its flourishing. So one, it's my job, two, the Bible. As we look down, what about competence? Competence is, brothers and sisters, you've got to start, and then you'll get better as you start, but it's going to be a pain line starting. First time you do it, you'll be covered in sweat like I was. <laughs> so just start. You know, let's have a look together. Here are the questions, here are the answers. Maybe do it at Christmas. Do you want to have a look? Please start, and then you grow, because what happens is you... You, 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 you know, you see it done, maybe you do a bit of training at church, you do it, you, 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 you get some feedback, you repeat it, and you gradually get better at it. And then lastly, courage, of course. Courage is, courage is that you say, do you want to have a look at the Bible with me? Courage is, I'm going to have a go at this. And maybe we'll be a group at church, we'll have a go at it, and we'll, 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 we'll come back to the group to support each other. Let's pray. Let's pray as we close. So, brothers and sisters, just one thought from the whole, as we've done all this, what's the one thing to take away, just as we pray? One thing to take away. One thing. What's the one thing you want to hold on to in 10 years' time? Oh, Father God, we ask your forgiveness when we haven't held out the hope of Jesus. Thank you that deep down what we most long to do is tell others of him. Thank you for the, the Spirit's work to cause us to long for that. Oh, Father, we do pray that the knowledge of the truth would lead to godliness. We pray that the godliness of telling others would emerge from this. Please, Father, do that, we ask. And we ask this for our own sake, for the sake of those around us, and for the glory of Jesus. Amen. We hope you're encouraged and inspired and ready to answer the call. Thank you for listening. 